if you're online, uh, say your name and uh, where you're from. So I'm Päivi Erola, an artist from Finland, and this is a live broadcast. And uh, at the moment, it's really sunny and hot in Finland, which is just wonderful. But there's some road work, and uh, then my birds are sing singing like crazy. I hope the, the sounds don't uh, get here. Uh, and I hope you hear me okay. So tell me if you can hear me okay and tell where you're from. So good to have you here live because it's totally different situation when I'm able to talk live instead of talking to camera only and then uh, edit the recording afterwards. I don't know why, but but it's it's it makes so much more sense to talk to real people and I hope you can respond once in a while to when I'm asking. So the first thing that I want to ask you is that have you been using Jelly Plate? Because this is this broadcast is called Jelly Plate Meets Fine Art. And the first thing I would like to know that if you've been using jelly plate or the or glass plate or plastic plate for mono printing, I used to use uh, a glass plate when I was a teenager in the 80s. And I actually fell in, fell in love with mono printing techniques. Maria says, looking forward to another use of jelly plate. And Bev says, I haven't used mine for ages. And that's why I need some inspiration, definitely. And uh, uh, the, uh, when I used the class plate, before jelly plate was uh, invented, um, I, I kind of f fell in love with monoprinting. I know it's a bit clumsy technique, and I also know it's not very... Uh, how would I say it's not very effective in that way that you can't get many prints out of that. That's mono print, one print that you can get. But I show some of the pieces I made. I have set a lot, so, but I only show a few that I made when I was a teenager. So here's one uh, piece made with acrylic paints and glass, a glass paint. Paint. Then here's another, a big bit bigger. Very simple, abstract. Then one that has been inspired by a photograph. These are my two sisters. I quite like this one, uh, and you can see how 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 uh, little you actually uh, can print there just to make the um, uh, the body so have some definition there. And then uh, here's also one uh, print and I have also saved the way I made these. So this is a bit different than what I've been seeing uh, that has been done with jelly plate, but totally doable with jelly plate too, not only glass plate. Of course, glass plate is a bit easier because you can see so well through. But I actually made this kind of kind of a diagram or a design, very simplified thing, uh, drawing. And then I put this on the, the class plate and then I painted all the areas very accurately, one color uh, at a time. So then it, it um, the final result was like this. And this is actually the technique that I, I used a lot. But today I show different kind of techniques, but I just wanted to show that so that uh, you can try that too, to make the drawing first and, and put it under the plate and then paint uh, on the plate and then press the paper. And I did one color at a time, but of course you can do many colors at a time too. You can you can do all kind of variations from that technique. 
But the idea for this session came from this, because I think that when we are children and when we are young, we naturally know what really inspires us. And I was so hooked on monoprinting that I want, want to use that once in a while, even if uh, I'm mostly inspired by the old art, old paintings, the sophistication in all of that. And actually, uh, a couple of weeks ago when I got this idea, the first thought that came to my mind that jelly plate and fine art, they're two separate worlds and you can't combine them. But then, you know, I always say that, uh, that uh, when you have many ideas, you have to start integrating them, combining them and integrating them into one. And that's also a way to create really unique art because when you pick ideas from separate fields, uh, separate worlds, and then you combine them. That's uh, the equation of uniqueness, really. And I feel that it's not only about the result, it's also about the process, that you can have a process that's really natural to you. And I think that especially the first project, how I've made it, it's very natural to me, but I also wanted to show another another piece made with a different kind of process uh, so that you can have a lot of ideas how to use your jelly plate and also how to use uh, fine art uh, as an inspiration. And with fine art uh, this this week, I'm mostly talking about old paintings from the Renaissance age to the 20th century Impressionists, the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, that's only because I wanted to narrow this, this topic. And I all also think that these are, are rarely combined with jelly plate. I think the combination is a bit bit weird even that uh, jelly plate is is not the first thing that comes to your mind if you're walking in a museum filled with renaissance art or something like that so i wanted to really challenge myself and stretch my creative limits and uh, and yeah so the first project um uh, that i planned i also show the sketch sketchbook that uh, I often uh, I have this kind of moleskin sketchbook and I often make some sketches uh, and plans. And the actual thing is that when I uh, make plans and use my colored pencils to, to also to visualize them, uh, this point I get rid of all the traditional uh, options you know <laughs> actually this is a uh, um, way to think about planning too that often the first things that come to your mind are very very traditional and that concerns everybody that doesn't mean that if you're artist you're above all that that it's just human thing that we uh, when we have to find a solution we think about the most common things and the most traditional ones. But when I use that sketchbook and write those downs down in that sketchbook, then when I start creating, I do things totally differently. So I kind of make a plan, but then when I start creating, I don't actually follow it. So the plan gives me the secure feeling that I know what I'm doing. And then when I start creating, my imagination takes over and my creativity takes over and I can find solutions that are much better. Actually, one uh, thing that I do before the sketchbook, if I don't have any ideas at all, is that I often look at YouTube and see how other people do it. And this, this might not work with all of you, but for me, it works really well because my personality is that I always want to find something new. So when I see people using jelly plate, for example, the, 
the immediate thought that I get is that that's not the way how to do it, even if I don't know the opposite. But I, I, I often get this opposite attitude that I want to find something really unique and not follow that thing, which is often really stupid, but it also brings very different kind of results which I love and I, which I want to show in my blog as well. I want to, I want my blog and all, all the classes that I provide to be especially useful to the point and something different that you haven't tried or, or, or experimented with before. So the first project, I will show you the first project so you can get the idea. So the first project uh, that I'm showing uh, is uh, this piece, and I've named it uh, as a nostalgia. And it, it, it actually summarizes the, uh, how would I say, mental theme or, or the mindset that, that I had when I prepared for this session and made these pieces that uh, I often get this feeling that I want to see old art. And, you know, we are quite young country. We don't have um, a lot of museums that would show really, really old art. They're mostly made in, uh, uh, 20, in, the, in the early 20th century, the oldest pieces or in the late uh, 19th century. And I often have this yearn to look at art uh, from the 16th or 17th century. And um, I get this feeling of nostalgia that I want to travel to that uh, world that is in the past. And uh, I want to, uh, I want to, experience all that beauty and express all that beauty. And then I also feel the sadness that I can't travel back in time. And of course, uh, if you think about this uh, opportunity that we can connect here online, then it's not <laughs> possibly the thing that I really want to do all the time. But uh, for one, once in a while, it would be really good to escape uh, uh, to the past. So this piece expresses that. And I'll show how I made this piece. And I think the most important, uh, in interesting thing is the intuitive process that I used here. I used two kind of processes. And uh, the first one is really intuitive. And the second one is more intentional. So I wanted to have a wide range of projects in that. But I'll, I'll now share the screen so that you can see the images, the process photos when I made this. And before that, of course, uh, let's look at some supplies. So I used. Uh, uh, just uh, golden heavy body acrylics, which are very regular uh, heavy body acrylics, uh, really good quality, this brand. Uh, but I also used glazing gloss uh, with it so that it won't dry immediately. So if you use ordinary acrylics and not those that dry uh, don't try so fast. Uh, there are also brands and uh, like that. Uh, then uh, using either glazing liquid or gel medium is a good thing because it uh, makes uh, the paint dry must slower. And uh, also another thing, it makes the paint more translucent, which is the effect that I've used in all, both of these pieces that I'm showing you. And uh, that's also a really good thing if you want to get inspired by the old art and get some nuances there and get some translucency there and build layers so that they won't get, um, get uh, too thick. And then I've also used some liquid acrylics. I have only one bottle, which is zinc white. And I've used this uh, for brushwork and also for some fa faces, 
uh, when printing with jelly plate because it's easy to drop uh, some some paint on the plate. Then uh, uh, one thing that you might uh, haven't used, I don't know, but I always use cotton cloth. And I use this to wipe off extra paint from my brushes. If I uh, change brush, uh, I try to protect the brush from, from uh, getting too much uh, paint, uh, which dries and, and then the brush is practically ruined. Uh, uh, I wipe off the extra paint with the cotton cloth. And I also use this uh, for making the shapes more elegant by wiping some extra paint off. So I think this is really useful. And for these two projects that I'm showing, I also used cotton cloth to clean my fingers, to clean my brushes. I always get a lot of mess around when I'm working with jelly plate. And when you're doing this kind of uh, more accurate work, you want to keep things quite clean. So cotton cloth is a good thing. And then my jelly plates are a small one, and which I use like a stamp. And then the bigger one, this is eight by 10 inches, uh, if I remember correctly, which I use for the whole background. So uh, I use two size of those, but of course, if you only have a big one, you can use it as a stamp as well. You don't have, have to put paint all over it. So the idea for this came from, actually from these kind of papers. I don't know if you have these kind of papers in your stash, but just messes practically. And um, don't look so inspiring at all. And uh, they have a, a lot of paint. But then I realized that actually, I, I don't know if I can show it in the camera, but the structure that these kind of papers have is, is a bit like an old painting that has been just aging for, for hundreds of years. And I thought, uh, and I thought, if I could use that effect to to bring the feel of old paintings, and I started with uh, the first project. I started with a watercolor paper, which is just blank, just blank watercolor paper, quite sturdy paper, so it's easy to print. And I always print so that uh, my plate is on the table and then I put the plate on top of it. So let's look at the first uh, images. I'm sharing my screen here. So now you should be able to see, see the first slide that I made. So the first project here is an expressive portrait on a pale background. And uh, I've used this image, Sandra Botticelli's uh, Madonna of the Book, if I remember correctly, as, an ins uh, as a loose reference for the face. So if you can see the face in the small window, as loose reference for the, for the, for the face. But other than that, I haven't used any any other references for, for this, but I wanted to put this uh, beautiful painting here so that we can um, examine it a bit and, uh, and, and see, see something that you might have not noticed in the old beautiful paintings like this, that it's full of a uh, visual flow that goes around the painting. So if you look at this like it would be abstract art, think about the color and think uh, uh, on the dress and think about uh, all the shades and how the shades are like shapes that form a flow around the painting. And that's the theory, the visual theory that I use a lot in my paintings and I also use a lot in these, that in these projects as well. And I think it's something that 
people who often say that their art is so stiff and they want to get looser often miss that there's uh, that most images that look really natural have these uh, flows of shapes and these shapes can be shadows and they can be just folds in a dress and such that are like little arrows that direct the eye ar around the painting and that makes the painting look so natural and often when we create stiff art our arrows our pointed shapes go all over the place around around the image and that way that brings the stiffness there so these old paintings have a magical visual flow and that's what i would like you to examine when you look at this next time that you don't just look oh there's the, the old madonna and uh, don't like this painting at all when you start to look at these kind of nuances you get new joy and new inspiration out of old art because those masters, they really knew what they were doing. Okay, let's look at the beginning. So here's my setting. So I had this watercolor paper and I also put masking tape around it so I could, I could remove it later and it looks much neater this way. Also, it has some space for, for, frame, for frame too. And then uh, I also had some brushes, of course, an embossing tool, but any plant stick uh, will do where you can do that you can use for doodling, then some paints, uh, some water just to clean the process and then use the cotton cloth to wipe the extra brush off. And then I used the brayer, but not for the paint, just to make the paper go really smoothly on top of the plate when I'm printing. So that, that's my supplies and my starting point. Then uh, the first phase is one thing that many omit is that the old paintings and the paintings that look really peaceful don't usually have a lot of bright white. And uh, often when we're creating, we want to show that bright white that's in the background. And especially when we're monoprinting, if you think, of the, think about those pieces I showed in the beginning, but actually when you want to connect with the old art, with the old fine art, then it's good to have some subtle tones in the background so that the bright white don't actually get through, but some other bright pastel, more pastel tones uh, that are there. The, this amazing, it, it's a very little thing, but it has a lot to do with the subtleness of the work. So the first layers were just pastel layers that I throw there. Some color variation, which is always good, but nothing. Um, no, I had no idea what this painting would be in at this point. Then you see that the, my jelly plate is covered with brown paint. And um, uh, this is like a foundation where I started having some fun. So I used my finger, I put some white paint, I used some, my finger to paint some, some organic details. I used the embossing tool to doodle some. And this was wild thing. I didn't think about anything like the nuances of Renaissance art or anything like that. I just had some fun with paint, fingers, doodling and, and stuff. So what I actually got was a mess, a very similar kind of mess that I showed in this, in this um, uh, piece of paper, very similar kind of mess. But you know, the, the, the solution here is to add some clarity to this mess. But I didn't do it intentionally at all. As you can see on the top, I just splashed some liquid paint 
and some dark spots there. But I made it so that it's not very symmetric and some spots are really a lot bigger. Actually, there's a really big white spot in the middle. And this way, I boosted my imagination and I experimented if I could see something there. If you just spread the paint really evenly, which is very common and very natural thing to do, very sensible thing to do, like decorating the Christmas tree, that you have to put every decoration very evenly. But if you spread the paint so that it's more symmetric, uh, doesn't follow uh, uh, the order at all, so that the spots go a bit uh, on the top of each other and such, it's easier to start to see what could be there because it starts to be an image, not just a surface pattern. And because we are building an image, not just a fabric design here, we want to have some big elements and some smaller elements. And then because I used this uh, bra uh, zinc white because that was the only uh, liquid paint that I had. Of course, I could have also used other colors and put some uh, glazing gloss, gloss there, thin it up. But because I used this white, I also uh, added another layer, which is more subtle. And this was yellow ochre, if I remember correctly. That is a very historical color. Ochre was used a lot in, in the Renaissance age. And I wanted to tone it down a bit because often that can also uh, make us see some, some images appearing there. Well, I don't know about you, but I, at this point I saw that there could be a face, that there could be someone and there could be some things around her. And uh, so I just, I didn't take any reference photos at, at this point, but of course you can pick some. There's nothing to be ashamed of, of using reference photos. But uh, because face is quite, I've, I've done quite a lot of faces and face is quite easy. I just sketched a loose, a loose face because it doesn't have to be very accurate at this point. So I made a paper stencil out of it. And uh, I, that way I was able to make, make it more distinct, the spot. And I was also able to add some darkness around it so that it's even more distinct and it brings also some depth uh, around, uh, around the face. But the actual shape is not so important here. If you finish this piece similarly than I did, that I used brushwork that where I could tweak some lines and such. But, but this was really important to me at this point that I clearly stated to myself that there will be a face. And uh, that way, uh, when I continued with the more intuitive stuff, um, I could, uh, my imagination uh, felt drawn to this detail more when it was, uh, it was more distinct. So that's more like a, like a mental process thing than anything else. Then after that, I started adding all kinds of fun details, but these are also quite subtle because I wanted to uh, save some of the messy background there. Uh, I would say rustic background also, because uh, there was also the, the rusticness there that I wanted to save. And at this point, as you can see, I didn't use my jelly plate fully, I just added some paint somewhere and then printed uh, the details on, on the painting. So I didn't cover the whole plate with the, with the paint, but only some. At this point, uh, the challenging thing a bit is to, to, you have to think about the mirror image, that you get the mirror image when you're pressing the plate. And uh, this, this was a bit challenging, but it's actually something that you can get used to quite easily.
and when you get more details you get more more uh, things that where you, that you can use for figuring that out then i started uh i changed the smaller plate and i started adding details uh with the smaller uh, plate and i i think this is stamping creative stamping so i added all kinds of of painted uh details and then stamped them and i actually love jelly plate because they don't get stamped so accurately so there's always some variation especially if you use this glazing liquid that may uh, when you use this so that the paint get, is thicker in some places and then uh, thinner in some places you get more variation and the detail doesn't look so flat so the old paintings they they have really a good sense of depth and that's what we are wanting to achieve here so here's uh the piece before i started using brushes and painting with brushes so this was my version of jelly plate so you can see that there are some uh like flowers i think about parrot tulips which are my favorite there and then uh, there are some maybe a hat maybe some hair i don't know but the point is that when you're working intuitively like this and when you're adding brushwork afterwards these details can be quite uh, blurry and not so distinct at all. And you can leave some space for imagination in the final piece as well. That also brings some depth, not to make everything so lined and, and defined. So then I started painting and I used that uh, Madonna as a loose reference. So here's, uh, here you can see some of the faces there. And I started with the thin white uh, sink. And uh, it, white, uh, there are several different whites in acrylic paints, but I used two. The other one is titanium white, and uh, the other one is zinc white. And zinc white is more translucent, transparent, and titanium white has a better coverage. And um, I used uh, zinc white for this uh, first layer. So I painted just some, some uh, details. How could the nose go and such? I didn't do any sketching, but I used this white paint as a sketch of some, some, uh, uh, some kind of sketch. And then when I continued uh, with the painting, uh, then I added more layers with oak, yellow ochre. And I also, in the final piece, I also added uh, some details, uh, 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 the, the dress and some on the head, but not much. There's really, really subtle things. And you can see a lot of jelly print here. So uh, here's the final, plea, final piece. So actually, before I show the next piece, um, uh, I'm asking you if you have used uh, this kind of combination that you ha have you used painting with jelly plate and you uh, meaning that everything is painted with acrylics and then uh, when you've uh, uh, finished the painting you also use brushwork there tell me if you have um, experimented with this combination The problem in this uh, thing, Bev says, yes, I've added mixed media on my prints. Yeah, uh, the problem with this uh, thing is that, uh, uh, I don't know if you have, Bev, experienced it, but to me, when I started uh, doing the brushwork, the temptation to cover the piece 
is a very big one. And I tried, uh, for example, those flowers, how easy would it be to just add some brushwork there? But actually, if you look at this piece, uh, and if you remember what I told about this uh, theme, the nostalgia, I wanted this uh, person to be the focal point. It's not actually so important what she sees. Uh, I wanted to uh, have more uh, emphasis on the feeling. And I also uh, added a little mistake there. And um, uh, yeah, Bev says, I do have trouble leaving things alone. Yeah, it's it's a big temptation. And um, with here, I also wanted the other eye to look at the flowers and the other eye be a bit sad. So there's a, there's a, a small mistake if you if you look at the face, but that that makes that expresses the the controversy of of the feeling uh, feeling nostalgic about the faces ab about the stiffness and the, uh, i want to just quickly address that because it so often comes up one thing to look from the old paintings uh is uh, the flow when you look at the face and uh, uh, every facial detail in humans is actually somehow connected with each other and every shadow is also have also an importance there uh, in terms of flow i'm i'm um, closing this screen for for what uh, unfocus this screen so that so that i can show a bit so if you if you think about your face uh, the way your your eyebrows go towards the nose and the way your eyes are a bit curvy and the way your lips are a bit curvy, they all have the purpose, and the nose and everything, they all have the purpose of being pointy shapes and the points should all build the flow. So in this piece, for example, the way the eyebrow brows meet the nose and the way that the 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 mouth is directed upwards to the eye all these matters and uh, uh this uh this flow is uh is the thing to look at when you creating faces and when you're painting faces also the the, uh, the points of the shadows that they point around the around the face that's really important you don't have to think about light sources where does the light come from how the, do the shadows go so much if you follow this rule of having a flow of pointed shapes around the face and thinking about the shapes as uh, as pointed elements that build the flow so that this is a very in-depth thing and when you're practicing it it's not easy and that's one reason why i have the community bloom and fly where all the members have the possibility to um send any of their pieces for feedback every tuesday so uh, that's something to consider if you have problems with the visual flow and problems with the stiffness to help me to to figure out where your blind spots are and how you can build a better flow uh, with that i also make visual suggestions and uh, and that can be uh, helpful to to see visually what what details can you tweak so that you get the better flow uh, into your images whether they are portraits or uh, fully abstract stuff it's general thing when you're creating art leon says i have used prints drawn on them rather than painted yeah that's also the possibility and that's um one thing that you could use that when you use the stencil i have the stencil here 
uh, uh, then uh, uh, maybe use the white as the stencil from the beginning and use the white background where you can draw it more easily than on the paint if you have problems with the paint. Of course, the effect won't be the same. The effect will be more contemporary, uh, not so old fashioned as in this, because uh, the idea of using thin paint is that actually, um, I don't know if you can see it in this, but the, actually the texture comes a bit through the painting, which is which just look like an old painting that has crackled a bit. And I think it's a lovely, lovely effect. Then uh, the, to the other project, which is 100% jelly plate. And I will enlarge this screen so that you can see it. So this is a very intentional thing. And this is 100% jelly plate, no brushwork nothing else than jelly plate and acrylic paints. And this is inspired by the old Dutch still life. I love this, especially from the golden age, from the uh, late sixth, uh, late 17th century. And um, uh, you know this uh, floral still life that rise from the dark backgrounds. And I didn't have any particular reference here but I used uh, the idea of starting from a black background and slowly building uh, the details out of it and then finally adding some, some glowing and brighter spots there. And uh, I think this is just uh, really fun. And also, of course, you can replace the black background with the pale one and uh, make the, the flowers rise from the light. That's also, that's, that's a more contemporary direction. But I wanted this to be really something that it really clearly connected with the past. So I started with the black background. So I actually started with the black gesso. And I often use black gesso when I want a back, black background if I'm not uh, producing canvas paintings and such, where, where the quality is really important. But that, that's quite economical situ solution because gesso is so much cheaper. And it's also really fun because you can easily draw on it. You can easily use colored pencils on it. So I could have... Uh, I could uh, add some colored pencils work, work uh, in the end if I wanted. And um, so, so I used black gesso for, for, for the first layer. And um, uh, I started with a ne very narrow color palette. So if you look at my palette at this point, it has some whites, glazing medium, yellow ochre, some uh umber, light and burnt umber, and then a little bit yellow. And I started with very, very wet paint. And with wet, I mean that I used a lot of glazing medium. Uh, I like to use glazing medium uh, more than, uh, 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 or gel medium more than wet water, because I think it uh, makes the pigment last longer. And uh, the, the problem with water is that the big, uh, pigment get, can, can get really separated and it doesn't really stick on the surface in the same way that when you use either of these mediums. So uh, the first thing that I did here was the marble table. And of course, because I'm working with jelly blade, this this was a bit clumsy, but I used a lot of uh, glazing medium and uh, made just a, a, a mess that has subtle changes from darkest to lightest and uh, and that was the first thing to do and after the table uh, or, or the horizontal um, uh, uh, area I added some details that could be part of the painting. So some leaves, some wake flowers, some fruits and that kind of stuff. But this was all very not not so defined at all. And if you look at the the print after this, 
it's almost black still. So it's very, very subtle. Then uh, on the next phase, I added a bit brighter details. So um, I don't remember how many layers I had, but of those subtle layers, you can have uh, a few, don't just not one, but a few, just to just to figure out what could be there. And then uh, I added some brighter details to uh, get more intentional what could be there. So I added some flowers and and you can also see how I use this embossing tool to doodle on these to get more defined and more details on those elements. I also think that lines that are really clumsy on a jelly plate they look much more sophisticated if you draw a line with a blunt stick uh, in the middle of it. So I used also that. And of course, when we're dealing with the old art, of course, then uh, we use organic shapes and flowing lines, not, not angular lines of any kind. The next thing that I did was that I brought, I made a stencil and you can see that my stencil was really weird. Uh, very weird shaped, but very organic too. So I wanted to have this kind of stencil for general use for this painting. So I, uh, uh, so by making this not so symmetrical, I was a able to use this with the leaves too, so that I could cover part of the leaves so that the, the part of the leaf is sharp, uh, and and uh, formed by a stencil, and then the other part is more loose. Here, the sharpness is around the stencil, and then the 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 blurriness is is around it. So I made one dark flower there this way, but I also used this stencil so that I covered a part of some detail with it and use uh, the different kind of. Um, uh, itches creatively there. So this stencil is quite small. Uh, if you probably can see it in the photo, I, I don't think I have it here. But um, yeah, it's quite small, small uh, there. Then I started adding more Dinsting flowers. So I added, started adding more flower, flowers. And this is one idea when you're using stamp to add color variations so that you actually change the color value, meaning that you change the brightness and darkness of the same color so that you can get some shading there and you can also get some some bright spots there. And the, the, the most ordinary thing, of course, is just to use one color, but I also added uh, darker, uh, some darker colors to tone that, that uh, bit and also some brighter ones and also some gel, uh, some glazing liquid so that it's not so even. So I actually, my aim was to not to produce so even and flat uh, results there. Then here are some of the techniques that I also used. I used this cotton cloth to, to make more defined edge. So you can see that there, there when I'm uh, painting a petal, I used uh, the cotton cloth to wipe some off. And then also just to make these kind of spots that don't make any sense, add some some blue and some red and, and some ochre and, and then see what's what's coming up there. And that way, having some soft color variation there. I used mostly two blues, which are ultramarine blue and cobalt blue. And these are very historical pigments. And also for the red, I used only one red and that's alizarin crimson. And alizarin red is very historical tone too. And you can get beautiful, beautiful, soft, warm pinks out of it. 
And then also one thing to consider, just to have random little spots and stamp some delicate spots there. And when you're doing these spots, don't spread them evenly. Just make a random, kind of random uh, pattern there, which looks much more natural there. You can also just put one or two or three spots and then stamp it or stamp it a bit and make sure that it's not even not like decorating the christmas tree but very uneven because the patterns in nature are just like that and the old art and a very organic are, are very organic in style and follow the nature's aesthetics in in many ways here's a close-up uh, this is not from the finished piece uh, I've just added some pattern on the on the vase there, and I think this is where jelly plate really shines. You can put some pat fun patterns on some elements and stamp it down there, and it's really easily attractive looking. And also the idea that don't cover the whole piece. You know, when the light hits to a metal play, metal vase or something, you see the patterning in some, from some corner, but not all over the place. If you, you if you put it all over, then it's more flat. And then uh, using a, a, a little bit more paint than what's necessary also produces this uh, that are called acrylic paint skins, skins skin patterns and that are very organic and fit so well with the leaves so i love that uh, pale green detail on there and and that that that's how jelly plate translate the delicacy and the uh, and the intricacy of 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 the patterns uh, you actually just uh, uh, have to put a little bit more paint than necessary and I also use uh, glazing medium to get that effect so you can see that in some places the pale green is a bit more translucent in some uh, some places it's a bit thicker and that's the glazing medium or gel medium that has that effect uh, there then when my piece started to look quite finished, uh, then one thing to remember is the way old masters used to finish their paintings, and that's adding some glows and adding some more darkness. So using dark, uh, dark colors like black to um, uh, do negative uh, work, like uh, making some shapes a little bit more defined, and then using whites and other pale tones to bring some shine. So if you compare these two images, look at the face. The, f the face in the first image has only this surface pattern that I added, that I showed in the previous slide. And if you look at the face on the other side, I've added some bright spots there. And it actually looks in the final image, when you look at it from a bit further perspective, it looks like the faint shines a bit and it's a bit, bit more three-dimensional. Also the flower there, you can see the big difference there when I've added some brighter colors there that it, it really becomes more lively and, and uh, also it brings the flowers on the front. So decide what elements you want to leave on the back and make uh, leave them more, more translucent and work less of them and then uh, pick details that you want to bring more on the front and use more brighter colors use brighter colors there and use some shiny white or pale spots there one thing to think about also when finishing your piece i'll show the finished piece here from the you can see it from the distance here and you can see the vase uh, uh here really well now uh, uh one thing to, to also to consider is that 
uh, not putting very bright colors and very white colors around the image so that it distracts and starts fighting with the focal points. So that's also one thing to think about, the, to make the colors more muted when they go further in the edges. So I call this Old Holland because uh, that's what I wanted to express with it. It's not probably, and it's not so sophisticated as those old pieces, but I kind of like uh, the, um, how would I say, it, it, it's probably not so static. So you can also think that uh, that these blurry shapes and, and working with the not so defined stuff bring more dynamic uh, feel to, to your work. So I will now stop uh, stop this sharing so I can show you the the piece here in person so you can get the uh, how, the idea of the scale. It doesn't probably sh let's see if I can show it a bit uh, here. You can probably sh see it better. But I will also post the images in the in the, in the blog po post, and you can see them sharper there. So definitely visit my blog a couple of hours after this replay and see all the images sharp there. Uh, Leon says, uh, maybe do you let the paint dry between layers? Um, yeah, you know, the acrylic paint dries really quickly, but uh, when talking about um, paint to dry with jelly plate, there are two things to consider. One is uh, what you probably ask is that do you let the paint dry on the actual painting between the layers? And yes, yes, I do but the acrylic paints dries really quickly so it doesn't practically slow down the process when i'm painting oil paintings drying takes um because i i use mostly poppy oil drying paints takes some like two weeks <laughs> but with acrylics it's like some minutes so it's quite easy uh but uh, uh, then another thing to consider is that do you let the paint dry when it's on the plate? And if you want to add uh, a lot of layers and then print at the same go, then you might want to let the paint dry on the plate, then add uh, another layer of wet paint and then press, press your image and let it dry there so that it pressed against the plate. And that way you can get several layers at the same time. But of course, when you're doing the finishing, when you're doing the details, then uh, uh, don't use that technique, just stamp quickly. I also often use extra paper where I remove extra paint um, from the plate, uh, but, uh, another thing to remember is that when you're making a flo floral still life like this, you might want to stamp a couple of more times the same same flower so that it it's like you the first flower that you stamp is on the front. The next one is a little bit further down uh, on the back and the last uh, stamp I actually have it there. It's just a hint of that color. And uh, it's just beautiful when the color gets repeated in this way that it gets repeated three, three times so that every repeat is a bit different than the other. The problem with repeats, if you want to do the sophisticated work, is often that you repeat the same thing identically. But if you make subtle changes with the repeats, it's not like the voice. You can imagine this as a music. Think about listening to the music that says bee, bee, bee. But think about how when you when you change the tone, like bee, bee, bee. 
then it's it's a music. <laughs> so it's the same thing with visuals. Then when you're repeating the shape, make some variation, let the size go a bit smaller, let some um, details uh, get varied a bit. And that's the power of jelly play, that when you stamp it several times, it never actually gets identical if you only have uh, little paint, not too much paint at all. Mary says, uh, just love the potential of different use of jelly paint. Thank you for your tutorial. And Leanne says, thank you, baby. I look forward to trying this technique, your inspiration. Thank you so much. And of course, if, you, if you're a beginner with jelly plate and you want to have some fun with mixed media, I have a new class called Collage Land, which is, I think, it's the most inspirational class I've produced. But that's, of course, that's my personal opinion. It's a very different class in a way that it sh I show pieces from the wide range of um, time period, which makes which adds a lot of depth in ideas too. I show basic process of getting inspired of in embroideries and textile art. And I also show how I've used that inspiration for six years. And that makes that class exceptional because, you know, uh, often when we art teachers create classes, we have a, a specific time period when, where we focus. But this class is so that I've brought a lot of stuff that I've been creating for six years into my studio. And I show all kind of stuff, how you can develop your designs further and what you can do with your designs. And I think that makes the class exceptionally inspirational. Another thing that's a bit different with that class is that you actually spent a day in my studio because the recording has been made during one long summer day. So you actually fly to Finland in that video and then you spent the day in my studio and it's been all recorded during one day. But... It's not like you you would watch 12 hours of me speaking. No, no, not at all. I've edited it so that it has so much to look at and so much inspiration. And it's two hours video, but full of inspiration. And uh, it's a bit like a, a small movie. So that's the class you might want to think about. And uh, available at my website, www.pionianparakit.com. And then if you need personal help and want to join the friendly community and want to dive deeper into fabric design, for example, that's one of the themes uh, in my community, Bloom and Flying Joy to community. Uh, and um, then uh, one more news, uh, I have, I'm have i having a new class for watercolor painting, but this is actually a class where you can use for several, also for acry acrylic painting too. But I focus on watercolor techniques, but I also teach a lot of general painting stuff. And it's called Watercolor Journey, and it will be for sale within a week or two. So make sure you are in my email list. You can subscribe my email list at www.pionianparakeet.com. And so that you get the notification when this class is for sale and it will start in June and it will be uh, offered as a part of the community. So you will join Bloom and Fly or by the class you come up to the same place with the same program. And yeah, of course, uh, uh, one more reason to sign up my weekly emails is of course that you get the free uh, mini course where I show all kinds of uh, little tweaks that you can do to liberate your pieces. Uh, also show a bit of this flow thing that I was talking about. So you have uh, uh, two quite inspirational videos uh, for free there too. So definitely subscribe to my e weekly emails if you haven't yet. So I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, and uh, it was lovely to see you talking in this chat too. It's I uh, uh, hope you have as hot and sunny day as we have in.
Finland here and if you want to see when you want to see the images again go to my blog after a few hours thank you everyone bye bye